tighter can. Um, and there is a, a scholar, his, uh, his name is Robert Eisman. I don't, uh, I have a lot of respect for the work that he does on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but at the same time, I kind of feel like that maybe it could be part of the plot of getting Christians to accept the law. So that's always my big caution there. Not to mention, uh, he clearly would be favorable to Noahide laws, which is a, which is a, the other big red flag for me. But his work that he has done on um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, this book right here is one that I've been working on called The Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered. Um, um, it's a little bit difficult for me to go through it because I, I tend to translate what other people translate regardless of their translation. Um, but he does do a fairly good job on translating. It's not that he doesn't. And uh, But Robert, he believes that the righteous teacher of the Qumran community was actually Jesus's brother James, uh, or better known as James the Just. And he makes a very good argument for that. Um, and I'm inclined to possibly agree with him, but I haven't, uh, like I said, I'm studying on this myself to see which direction I would go in on that because I don't really rightly know as of yet. The other thing though, that um, he makes the comment in some of the lectures I listen to that he does that the, the, the church made the mistake of saying that Peter was the head of the church when in fact it was actually James and not Peter. I The church may say that, but I personally, when I did the video, uh, uh, The Keys to the Kingdom, that's when I recognized the fact that the keys of the kingdom that Jesus gave Peter had nothing to do with making him the head of the church. He said, upon this rock, I build my church. It was the spiritual revelation of who Christ was and how to get that revelation. That's why I argue that anyone could have the keys to the kingdom. So in essence, although because of that being that statement Jesus made about Peter, a lot of people have assumed that that made Peter the head of the church and so he considers that like an inconsistency in the scripture of the New Testament, but I differ with him on that. Uh, James truly was the leader, and uh, we know this from the Egyptian writings, better known as Nag Hammadi writings, that were discovered in Egypt in 1947, uh, because in those writings there, that's, where, that's one of the places where we find out that Jesus made James the leader um, of the church. And of course, when you read in the um, writings of Paul, you, you tend to find that as well. Uh, you find different places in there that very clearly seem to define that he was the one that kind of led the apostles afterwards. But that's not really the re thing I wanted to talk to you about tonight, though. What I wanted to get into, because one of the things that he mentions in here, he was talking about some of the different um, imagery and one of those imageries that he speaks about in this here is called it uses the word tongue um and he talks about the the slandering tongue for example and as soon as i read that i began to realize that maybe especially when we're looking this at more like in an imagery that we're probably missing out on some very important uh, aspects in regards to that. So I'm going to take and show some of these things with you here. So we're going to we're going to actually start. I don't know if I want to start in the book of Jude as of yet. So we may jump back to it just to start with though, the very most probably most prevalent scripture of all that people think about. And um we think about tongue and and more of more as a 
Um, in some cases, people wouldn't look at it as an allegoric sense, but more of a literal. But in this case here, if you look in the book of Acts, we read that, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Uh, let's just back it up at the beginning here. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a Russian mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them, and notice that right there, and I'm not, I don't have the Greek in front of me to compare it, and I'm not a Greek scholar, so I wouldn't know if it's how the translation would be to begin with, but, so we'll just take it for face value that the English is, is as accurate as we could no, at this point. But it says, and there appeared. So it's visual. It's something they can see. Unto them, cloven tongues, which is like a divided tongue. In other words, like, I guess, multiple tongues. Like as a fire. So what appears to them is, is fire, but it's in the shape of a tongue. In fact, there's been uh, pictures that artists have done in the renditions of the um, the upper room incident, and that's what they'll show. They show like a a fire that is over the top of the, the people's heads that receive the Holy Spirit, and it says it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. So now we have we have two different types here. One, it's the fire that come down into the room when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it actually broke apart. That's what the word cloven is. It is literally like divided. It divided. It's like it came in as one, maybe solid, but then divided itself over each individual. And it was like that of a fire. And it appeared to them over each one of them. Then it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling uh, in at Jerusalem, Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, were confounded, because every man heard them speak in his own language. So they were speaking in other tongues, but yet every man could hear in their own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Now, by the way, when it says they heard in their own tongue wherein they were born, that's a little side note. They're all Judeans. So in other words, they're all Jewish by ancestry, but yet they weren't born in Israel uh, during those times. They were born in other countries. So they spoke these other languages, you know, whether it be from Mesopotamia, from Egypt, Libya, Rome, wherever they may have been, Arabia, you name it, they were from all over the known world at that time, but they were hearing in their own native language in which they were born in. So what really is a miracle? It seems that the miracle is hearing, which is kind of interesting because Jesus says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Now, here's the, here's the fascinating thing about this, though. Like I said, the word tongue is has more of an imagery than I think what we realize. If you take the Dead Sea Scrolls is a very interesting um, writing as well, because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have many, many, many times that the, that the word tongue is used as an analogy. Everything from a serpent's tongue, the lying tongue, and that was what caught my attention too, because I knew that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it often uses the terminology, the lying tongue. And uh, and when I thought of that, and then of course I'm reading there where Robert is talking about these um, this imagery use of the word tongues in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I, I knew exactly what he was talking about, then I couldn't help but think, could that be, when we're reading those things, like the, in the case of the lying tongue, could we actually be looking at a false Holy Spirit, so to speak? And uh, and and kind of to, to boast uh, or boost that, I think it's Colossians. Um, uh, 
Uh, let's see, maybe it's not Colossians. Let me see here. Oh, it's not the one I was looking for. Um, is it Corinthians? No, it's not the one I'm looking for either. Where was it at? I don't recall now. I thought I put it up here. Maybe I did not, but I'm thinking about the scripture where it talks about test the spirits to see if they be of God is the scripture I'm thinking about. Uh, but I may have forgot to put it up there. All right. So let me, let me though, I wanted to show those something to you here. I got to find it. How do I get to it here? Uh, I may have to stop share to make it work. All right, good. We didn't leave nobody outside in the cold here. That's the other thing I was saying about. All right, uh, so let's see. Go back to share. Maybe I can find what I'm looking for now. Yeah, I think this is this is one here. Um, and again, uh, imagery. It's mainly here at the bottom. Here is what I'm looking at here. Uh, Truth appeared in all its em emanations, knew it. They greeted the Father in truth with a perfect power that joins them with the Father. For as everyone who loves the truth, because the truth is the mouth of the Father, his tongue is the Holy Spirit. He is joined to truth, is joined to the, and I don't know, I, this was I copied a long time ago, and I don't know exactly, I knew I copied it because of that, but I don't know what the next part was on there. But that's an interesting concept, and I've actually found that in several documents where it uses the, the, the word tongue as a type of the Holy Spirit of the Father as well. And there's one other one, but it keeps disappearing. Let me pull it up real quick. So maybe I can get it to pull up every time I disappears from the screen for some reason. Okay. This one I had pulled up, it disappears from my screen every single time I put it up here. And I do not know why. And so I'm just going through all of them. See if I can find it. It won't let me once we're in the in the Zoom. It does not. Um, it does not allow me to uh, minimize the screen to where I could just easily pull it up. So uh, that's what's giving me the hard time here. Let's see. Maybe that was it. Let's see. No, that's the... Uh, well, I don't even know what file I'm in. It's like it puts me in some weird file and I can't... I've got everything that I don't need. All right, let's see. Try a different one. Not that way either. It is not going to, let's see, maybe I can pull the screen down. There we go. There we go. I figured out how to do it now. Now I might be able to get it up here. If it doesn't disappear on me again. And let's see, is that it? it as soon as I pull it up, it disappears. Let's see here. All right, I'm, oh gosh, it, it won't even let me, it, it, that is the strangest thing I have ever seen in my life, how that just disappears on me immediately. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, because I don't have time to switch it back over. I'm going to read it to you, because as soon as I leave the page, it'll disappear on me. It said, even those who eat my bread have raised their heel against me. Now, by the way, this is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Think about it. So as, you, as I'm reading this, think about this here and think about, I mean, 
you can't help but think of Jesus in this one. Even those who eat my bread have raised their heel against me. They have mocked me with an unjust tongue. All those who have joined my counsel, the men of my congregation, are stubborn and mutter round about. And about the mystery of which you have concealed in me, they go slandering, go to the sons of destruction in order to show my path. And because of their guilt, you have concealed the source of understanding and foundation of truth. They plot evil in their heart. Men of Belial have opened a lying tongue. Like viper's venom they, uh, that spreads to the extremities, like crawlers in the dust, they shoot to grab serpent's poison against which there is no incantation. It, it has become an incurable pain, a wasting disease in the in innards of your servant, which makes the spirit stagger, makes an end and strength so that he is unable to remain firm in his place. They have overtaken me in a narrow places where there is no escape. Now, when you read that, you cannot, I mean, at least for me anyway, I cannot help but, but, believe that it's actually speaking of Jesus Christ. And, and then the thing is, you see that you can't, I'm going to try to share it with you because for some reason it didn't disappear this time. So let me see if I can pull it off. There we go. That's it right there. And notice right here, we're at the top part, you know, they have raised their heel against me. They have mocked me with an unjust tongue. That's just like in the scripture, you know, in Genesis, where it talks about, you know, that they would bruise his heel and he would bruise their head. And that's one of the things that comes to my mind. But the other thing is, is the imagery here of the lying tongue. So if when we say that, though, if we look at that as a lying tongue, and the lying tongue is like the viper's venom and spreads to the extremities, etc. It reminds me of a false spirit. A, 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 because see, the thing is that the two spirits in the last days are so close that it's, it would deceive the very elect if it were possible. Now, that's this is now when we want to go to the to Jude. All right, so I got to stop here so I can make it work to go to the other direction here. Let's go to navigate and. This screen is not fun. Let's see now. Look over here. All right. And I'll, I'm going to read this one before I jump out of this one real quick. This here being in First Corinthians. Uh, and again, Paul just giving, you know, imagery about it. You know, I would that you all speak with tongues. Of course, we know that there is unknown tongues that people speak with as well. And uh, but he said, but rather that you prophesy for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except that he interpret it and that the church may receive at a fine. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall it profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophecy or by doctrine? Um, that's just because I had it up there. I forgot why I put it in there. But anyway, I wanted to take you to Jude, though, because. This is where that deception really comes in. And we're living in a day and age that the receiving of the Holy Spirit, the true baptism of the Holy Spirit of the Heavenly Father is so critical and so crucial. And, um, and yet at the same time, Satan has got a counterfeit. And it seems to me that too many people fall into that trap of that counterfeit spirit. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you, peace and love be multiplied. And by the way, even though this is a single chapter book, this has got more information than most other books altogether. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you to the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. When you go to really research that research, the common salvation is basically they had allowed salvation to become common. He's not, he's trying to get them back to the original faith that was delivered to the, to the basically the saints or the apostles 
what Christ really brought to them. He said, for there are certain men crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the only time in biblical history that we're aware of that anyone was ever ordained to condemnation were the fallen angels. They were ordained to condemnation because of what they did. Mingling the seed and corrupting the bloodline. He says, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So these guys, they crept in unaware. They're inside the church, even back during the days when the apostles are still on the earth there. They're foreordained to condemnation like the Nephilim. So undoubtedly, they have to be Nephilim in that case there as well. They're ungodly men. They turn the grace of, of our God into lascivi lasciviousness. It's not that they're not, quote unquote, preaching the gospel. It's the what they're doing with the gospel. He says, I will therefore put in your remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, af afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, that's why he says up there, certain men crept in unaware. Now he's actually speaking about them. They kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation he hath reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness and the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. By the way, I don't know if anybody's ever really paid close attention to that. You can't have fornication. Fornication is not same-sex uh, relationship. That's something a lot of people don't know. That was, and there was, there was actually an amazing uh, scholar that I ran across one time. I'd already had this suspicion, and I actually had spoke on it, only to find out there was another scholar that had actually spoke on the exact same thing, and he did a better job than I did because he knew the Greek language really well. When it speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah, no, no, I shouldn't say, I'll take that. When it speaks that they went after strange flesh, I had not paid attention to the Hebrew on that. It wasn't talking about men with men. We assume that because they came after the angels that had come in to Lot to try to bring him out. So it was it's it's the assumption that they were wanting to have a promiscuous uh sexual relationship with him. And they may and they may have. I'm not saying that they that, that wasn't their intent. And I don't doubt that homosexuality was prevalent in that day and age as well and in Sodom and Gomorrah. But when it talks about they went after strange flesh, that's fallen angels. It's not, it's not man with man, woman with woman. Although, like I said, that could have very well been in the case of, of Sodom and Gomorrah as well. But giving themselves over to fornication was the fact that they were sleeping with a species that's not their own. Now, that's literally in, I think that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls is where I found that out before, that fornication is not, um, that fornication is, let's see, how's it worded in there? I don't, I wish I had that pulled up. I'd show it to you. But um, in one of the documents that I was reading in there, it says that fornication is not um, uh, the promiscuous, in other words, it's not a relationship here of adultery that's here on the earth, but it's, it's, it's the case of having a, rela a sexual relationship with a species other than your own kind. And now we have modern definitions today that would be different than that. It would it would more include the type situations that we know today.
but of a biblical source and stuff when we look at it biblically or from documents of biblical era. I don't say that they're biblical, but from the biblical times, uh, they define the fornication as basically being the fact of fallen angels having sexual relations with earthly women. And that's what they call fornication. So that was what I caught uh, and, and what uh, Jude is saying here as well. Uh, and giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, the other scholar, he took this Greek right here and showed what this Greek word, and I have no idea what it is because I don't have that in front of me. And that's where he determined that it's not anything to do with men with men. It's, again, um, non-human, so to speak. Likewise, all, likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Uh, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending uh, with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perish in the gain, saying of Korah, these are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of, sea, on the, of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. That's going to be bringing the judgment, to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them and all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and all uh, their hard speech, speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. Um, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. How, who should walk after their own ungodly lust? These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. And some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Mm. That's an interesting thought concept as well. Hating... Uh, all others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. That garment, by the way, is your flesh itself. Uh, so you get into that, and then, like I said, we you know the more we you dive into these analogies that that are out there. Then, then you cannot, uh, and this is another one I thought was interesting as well, and a lot of people use this here, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I think this is in the book of Mark, if I remember right. Um, but he that believeth not shall be damned, and th these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and they shall drink, or if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, when it says they shall speak with new tongues, could it be, you know, I mean, I, mean, I do know people speak in tongues. I mean, I'm not saying that they don't. And I'm not here to condemn any of that. That's, that's to each individual how God leads them. But could there be something even deeper than that that we're not even paying attention to? Don't know. But this one here, though, they shall take up serpents. Remember how the scripture also said they'll tread on the heads of serpents? Or you'll hit you'll Jesus said you'll tread on the heads of serpents and scorpions. 
And then you come to the state of Tennessee and one of their fa famous tags that they have is a tag of a rattlesnake coiled up and it says, don't tread on me. Makes me wonder about the Bible Belt State and what they really stand for. Uh, I'm, and I'm not saying how to get people in Tennessee, but for the most part, Tennessee people are great people. But it makes me really wonder about some of those people in Tennessee. Uh, and, you know, what 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 are they what are they really standing up for? So just an interesting concept there. Uh, and let's see, first Corinthians, what do we have here? I would that you all speak with tongues. Okay, we already know that. I think we did that one a minute ago there. There was another one I wanted to bring out too, though, before we close up. And then we'll talk. We'll just, I'll, you can ask some questions tonight if you want. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby, oh, that's the one I was looking for earlier. It was this one right here. Try the spirits, because there again, it is a lying tongue. And I think that lying tongue is probably more of an analogy speaking of a false spirit. Uh, not just the fact that they come out and tell a bunch of lies, but in other words, a lying tongue. Because if truly, if if God's spirit, let's say it's, I, I think that's more of an analogy too, that's, that's from that writing, and uh, I think that one, oh no, that one's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, well, that, no, the lying tongue's the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Father's tongue is in the Nag Hammadi work that they did there. I think that was in what they call the gospel of truth. And and I don't like to endorse those as scriptural, but historical. Yes, they are historical. We can't deny that. But the validity of, I mean, some of it can really make your hair stand on your head. Let's just put it that way. So I, I don't, I, I look at it from a historical point, but I do find fascinating though, when they overlap scripture and, and we start seeing similarities there. Anyway, the, um, in, in the gospel, or first John, John says, believe, uh, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Most people don't have any clue what that really means. And that's one, because, and I'll never forget it, God said, he says, okay, he says, now, if that, he said, if you take it for face value, he says, what if the drunk comes along? Yes, yeah, the drunk. You believe Jesus Christ is the son of God? And he goes, yeah, Rob, boy, something's fire for him, son of God, hallelujah. He said, does that make him a believer? Go with the spirit of God? No. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That is the key to verse 2. Every spirit that confesses basically that Christ has come in your flesh. That is the spirit of God. Because you see, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's Christ in you. And I think that's what I had Colossians up for. Um, yeah, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So that's just something I wanted to share. Uh, there's, there's actually a deeper one I wanted to go into tonight. And, I, and But when I got into that, I'm like, okay, I'll save this other one till next time. Uh, and then we'll get into that later. So anyway, let me unshare this screen here. And if you guys have got questions and want to ask something, uh, by all means, let's get started. Nope, I don't know the answer to that either. Nope, don't know that answer either. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, if you want to throw a hand up, you can. Or if you just want to unmute yourself and ask, go right ahead. Nancy's got all those flowers back there, boy. 
Do you grow those yourself? Are they fake? Are they real? It Which looks one? like a mortuary, doesn't it? <laughs> no, I didn't even think that now. That's, see, that's, see, you don't give yourself away. Now you're going to make me think that all the time. <laughs> no, what it is is I, my grandchildren have moved into my house with me. And so I had to take all of the all of the flowers. Otherwise, the three-year-old's going to pick them all apart. Yes. Well, then the floor would be decorated for sure, right? The floor would be decorated, yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. So I don't care if we get into a crazy subject. If you guys got any questions to ask, you know, this is the best time to find. I don't, don't all know the answer, but hey, who knows? So, or maybe I've done taught long enough all these years. Y'all already know all the answers. <laughs> all right, Kim, go ahead. Hi, good evening, and thank you. This is very interesting. You know, how, ma how many times, you know, you read um, what happened in that upper room, and for the first time, I guess, when you were uh, reading that, and I thought, you know, I have seen that depiction where it's like it's over their heads, and it doesn't say that's how it was, and so I was looking at you here on camera, and I thought, okay, what would make me say it looked like a tongue and if that's the first layer you know like you said there's there's obviously different layers to this and so I was just looking at you like if I was in the room and I looked across what would make me write down it looked like cloven tongue so I looked up cloven here in my um uh Thayer lexicon so I was just while well, I was listening to you but this is the the thing in order for me to give that, um, and it's interesting in what, how many times the word tongue was used in just a couple, several sentences right after one meaning, actually languages, one meaning, it looked like a tongue. So I thought if it was on your shoulder and kind of went out, came back, when, like what would make someone say it looked like a tongue? And um, I, I really like... Uh, really you kind of jumped around the map and and it's true there's so many angles to this but for the first time I thought you know I've bought into it being over everybody's head and it looked like a little flickering flame right. and uh, no that's not what it said and whether that's right. It, right it went out and retracted went out retracted you know I thought how many times do you actually look at a tongue other than the tip of someone's tongue we really don't look at them and and I'll pause I'll just stop there um, that's and, fascinating, Kim. I, I like that because, right? What maybe it was over the shoulder? Uh, yeah, it it might have right been shooting right out on like your li lips, even. Right. I mean, I'm in agreement. You know, and 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 when you say that, what's fascinating? There is one, and I have seen it. I've read it, and I just read it recently. And I don't even. I may have saved it tonight. I don't remember if I did or didn't. But it's implying almost that it's passed like a kiss itself. But it's it's the in the in the one that I found on that, it's like the father, it's like the father comes and it's like he's kissing you. Remember how the scripture says, kiss the son? You know? Uh, and uh, let me start and pull that up real quick because that's an interesting aspect as well. That that was very much a a, a uh, a Middle Eastern tradition, and still is, um, and even like in Europe, my wife's family is very much like that too, you know, and of course, they don't kiss you on the lips, they kiss you on the cheek and stuff, but it says, you know, in Psalm 2, you know, kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled, and, and what's interesting is when Jesus comes to Simon's house, that was one of the things that he brings up, he says, you know, it talks about uh, Mary, who was there, who was washing his feet and, and drying them with her hair and, and kissing his feet. And he says, this woman, since I entered the room, has not ceased to kiss me. He said, but you didn't greet me with a kiss. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's what I like about when you can talk with people directly like this, too, because I learned so much as well. And that's just really a a blessing for me to be able to to listen to you guys and hear things that you have to say. You'd be surprised. Even sometimes I don't read a lot of comments when I do videos because if I if I read comments, it's kind of like answering emails, right? I've got 
I don't know, something like 30,000 unanswered emails. And I get probably close to a thousand emails a day. So uh, now a lot of that's repetitive stuff because there's some people that they send you a lot of information and sometimes I catch it just right and it's really interesting and I, and I want to use that. But when I do catch a comment or something, it helps me to dig deeper. And I really like that. Brother Galen, go ahead, sir. Galen's got his sword ready. It keeps me nervous. <laughs> hey, Steve. I was, uh, I'm thinking probably familiar with David Jacobs' uh, research. Yes. Um, on alien hybrids. Well, you know, I wondered about this this uh, issue of strange flesh for a long, long time, and I kind of figured it out, uh, you know, some time ago. But you know, really, it takes on a very interesting context, you know, because that's what's happening that that program. So. Yes, yes, and I wish <laughs> I could remember. I think the guy that I learned this from when I years ago and I mean that's been a long time too when I first did this so some of you guys that have been around for a while might remember me speaking on that and I actually I think I played a clip of that guy that spoke I, I say he was a scholar he may have been a minister maybe not a scholar I may have made the mistake of saying that I mean to me scholarship I don't half the scholars I know are probably all retards so I don't know if that's a nice way to put it, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but yeah, you know, you, it, it's funny too, how, how people become quote unquote scholars. That's fascinating in itself. My, my oldest son is uh, about 38 years old. He's a history professor. He's working on his doctorate right now. Um, very brilliant. Uh, I call him a young man. He's, I told him he's getting old though now. So but uh, but 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 at any rate, when he was a little boy, about 15 years old, he was working with me and uh, and we go to this guy's house. And, and I think the guy was an actual doctor, like a medical doctor or something like that. We're, we're leaving and he looks at my son. He says he says just out of the blue, he tells him, he says he said, look, he said, Nick, he said, I realize your dad. He's a pretty stupid guy. He said, but um, I think in about 10 years, he might become a genius. So just kind of bear with him, you know, and that went right over my son's head. Whoop, there it went. <laughs> but but what and it's funny, though, you know, how it goes about 10 years later, dad becomes a genius. But now that he's getting into his doctorate level and he's been a uh, he first was a school teacher and stuff in history and stuff. But now he's gotten intelligent again. And now daddy's dumb again. So but so I'm sitting there thinking to myself as I as I, the point I was thinking about. I'm thinking to myself, now my son will technically, I guess, quote unquote, become a scholar eventually. He's big into writing papers and things like that. And he speaks around the country at different universities. And I'm like, he's going to be a scholar. And I bet, well, I won't even go there. Now, I got to tell you guys another funny one, too. And then we'll get back to the serious questions here. Uh, my oldest daughter is like, 33 years old just to show you how people pay attention to things you do or say I I was online and at that time I owned a trucking company shoot when she was about 10 years old and I'm looking at this uh, catalog for equipment that I needed to buy and it just so happened on the catalog the name of the company was Acme ACME and she comes walking by she sees that on my desk and she says are you planning on ordering anything from them? And I said, well, yeah, I was planning on it. She said, I wouldn't. I mean, she was dead serious. And I said, why wouldn't you? She said, daddy, Willie Coyote has been buying from them for years. And she said, ain't nothing ever worked he ever used. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. Anyway, the darndest things kids say, right? Uh all right. Anybody else got a question? So any of it's just something, it don't have to be a question. It's just something you want to share about and we can do.
discuss it. It's a great, great opportunity, you know, because you never know. You might have something on your mind that might be on somebody else's mind that'll listen to this later. So, you know, this is a great time. I think that's what we ought to do, too. Even like maybe next week is maybe get, that way you guys can think about in between now and then. And let me make sure because I know how some people are. They, they're afraid to. They don't want to say it. So they'll write it. And I'm bad about not reading. Brother Steve, please look into the connection between what's well, hard for me to see. Un... All right, let me get a different pair of glasses. You know, my sight got better. And so I'm really having a hard time to figure out which glasses to wear. Unnamed. MAC addresses and M band. I can if you have any, please don't. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was not supposed to read this out loud. Well, doggone it. Don't you know everybody in here can see the question too? <laughs> so, all right. I ain't going to read the rest of it then. Kim, go ahead. Okay. I'm going back to the reference of. Um... The, the men of the past, there in Jude, um, certain, let's see, certain men crept unawares who were before of old. So here I am listening to you and looking up in the lexicon here, 3819. Uh, one of them uh, with men is 444. I thought that was interesting. And I kept looking and looking. I can't, but the, the interesting word popped up was gladiator. And I thought, that's interesting, but I can't quite pin down what I was looking for. But then I looked at old, men of old. And it says here, um, a reference um, explicitly to times long past. Um, yeah, you know, and we read these, these passages and we just keep going and we might be focused on one thing and we don't catch. I, I have to say, I thank you. I don't know that I ever caught how many years you read scripture. And then you're like, and that's what's so beautiful is if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled. Amen. And I can't remember ever catching. They could have been um, that. Well, I don't know. What is the exact word? Nephilim or fallen angels? Um, yeah, well, the, interesting. The, right. You actually, Kim, you have two different thank types. You. Let me, you're very welcome. And thank you for. And, and what you're experiencing now is what I experienced when I first saw that. And, and I can tell you, it's almost like every time I go into a scripture like that, I'll get a new understanding with it, a new revelation from it. And, and it just, it just blows me away. Um, and, and I know I'm probably going to drive you guys nuts when we go back to this scripture here because you know it. But for the sake of Kim, I think it'd be good to go into this one. Let me find it real quick. That's the one about the Nephilim. Um, and probably everybody here has it memorized except me. So I think it's, oh, is it? No, is it? Ooh. That is in. Was it? Deuteronomy or Numbers or Leviticus. I forget now. Let me see. We'll try. No, it's not. Not Numbers. All right. So I know on my screen when it's highlighted, that's how I know it's what it, what it should be. Here, let's see. Bible, Deuteronomy, chapter. While you're looking, I was just thinking, you know, the phrase uh, men of renown. I, I don't know which passage that one's in. Genesis and, 6, I believe, is that one. Yeah. And then it. my husband was just sitting here and he said, you know, he just came in here and he said, I was just watching something last night. And they were talking about, and they used that phrase specifically, uh, the men of old. Thank you. And I'll, I'll put on mute. Thank you. Yeah. The um, If you can, Kim, can you find that real quick, that scripture there? I'm actually in Genesis yeah. now. I think that's where that was. Yeah, here, I found Genesis uh, 6, verse 4. I'm going to share the screen so you guys can see what I'm looking at here because uh, this is another example here. Um, and I really want to be able to uh, find that other one. 
Ron, you ought to know where that other one is that I'm wanting to find. Um, we're, to, we're at the last part of the verse. I go into it a lot where it talks about the Nephilim and stuff. And, and I always show the difference between Nephilim and Nephilim. All right, here's the one about the men of renown right here. Anashe uh, uh, Hashem. And literally the word renown they're using is the name. That's it right there, what I just highlighted. Hashem. And uh, and so the Anashe are the men, in plural, the Yod makes the word plural right there. Uh, it's the men of the name. But What's fascinating, I think in the King James, you probably have giants here instead of Nephilim. Uh, it says the Nephilim were in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. A lot of people, they assume because it says right here to your left, B'nai Ahalahim, which is the sons of God. Elba Abanot, uh, to the daughters of Adam, which are the daughters of Adam or the daughters of man, and the Yaladu, which means, and they birthed to them. Uh, they birthed to them, and Hema Ha Giborim, the Giborim or Giborim, however you want to pronounce that. Those are also, that's another terminology that's often used for the word giants at that time. Uh, mighty, yes, you can also translate that as mighty men. Uh, and it says, meolam, mighty men that were of old. Literally, now this is what's fascinating. Remember I said you learn something every time you go into something, you didn't pay attention to it the first time around or the... 20th time or the 100th time around, I just caught something I never noticed before. All right. It says here that the same were the mighty men that were of old. That's how they translate this right here. Meolam. Meolam doesn't mean, well, you could translate it were of old. That would be okay. But it's actually from eternity. The first letter there, when I highlight this, do you guys see that okay? Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother Paul. The mem in the beginning right there, okay, that means from. Olam, it's, it's hard to come up with a word for eternity in Hebrew. There's a lot of different words that can be used, but olam is typically normally without beginning or end. All right, so I'm going to separate that so you can see it. It's a compound word here. So it's from eternity. Now, the Nephilim, hmm, I really need to find that other one. Brother Ron, did you happen to remember where that might be? Or maybe Galen, yourself, or Paul, where I, where I have that Nephilim in two different places. One's Nephilim, because we got that again. I believe it was in Genesis, but I'll have to look. Yeah, I forget too, Brother Ron. All right, I just, this is another one. I got to find that other one now. So let me see if I can find it as well. Um, oh, Enoch, that'd be a good way to look it up. I remember now. Let me let me unshare the screen for a second because we're fixing to, we're fixing to run into something again that I, that I did not catch, a second thing I didn't catch before in the past. So you guys are going to, Y'all get to see what I go through when I'm doing all these studies. It's so fun to do. Um, all right, so we want Enoch. And I think you may be, let's see, okay. Uh, oh, it, it is numbers. That's where it's at. Okay, it's going to be numbers. I say numbers. Yep, numbers 13. That's where it's at. All right, so I'll get numbers. I'll get back on the share screen. You guys know how careful I've got to be. I've got a doctor in the room in here, boy. And you, if I make a mistake, that guy's going to tear me up. Let's see here. Share screen. All right. Now, I'm going to jump to...
Let me go over here. I'll switch the Psalm here to numbers. Oh, there we go. Numbers chapter 13. All right. Yes, it's exactly what I thought. All right. You guys can see this okay, right? We have here, and there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come of, now they put Nephilim again. Now, if you'll notice, they spell it N-E-P-H-I-L-I-M, okay? That's how they spell that. On the second one and the first one, they spell it identical. In the case, when you look here to the left here in the Hebrew language, they're not spelled identical. So why do they spell it identical over here? There again, that's the assumption of the scholars that are, they're just assuming that Moses is dyslexic like I am and can't spell. Maybe he was, I don't know. But I don't think that's the case because when you read the context, they saw the Nephilim, and they were the sons of Anak who come of the Nephilim. I pronounced it differently intentionally because it's spelled differently. Here we go right here. You got a hey, a noon, second letter, third letter, uh, a fe. And then here we have the one letter in here that's different then in the word in green. Uh, and I wish I could tell you what they look like so it would make sense, right? But in other words, you can see this letter here and you can see, which is a fe, and this letter right, whoop, that letter there, which is a lamet, like an L sound, all right? And then there's that little funny looking thing in the middle, but over here, which that's called a yod, in the green, we don't have any letter in the middle, all right? So what does that tell us? The vowels in Hebrew are not properly placed. You have to remember, the Masoretic text, which is what we have for Hebrew today, was not published for almost a thousand years after Jesus Christ. If you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't have all these vowels, dots, and dashes, and stuff like that. So when the rabbis try to say, when Jesus said, you know, not one jot or dot or tittle will pass from the wall to all be fulfilled, he's not talking about these goofy little things that they put in there, these little three dots under that letter, two under that. The rabbis did this, and, and I don't fault them for doing it. It's, it wasn't a bad idea in a way, you know, it kind of helped preserve the ability to be able to pronounce the words properly. But then what happens, though, is they put the vowels in the wrong place that don't belong when Moses clearly spelled it differently. And anytime you have that yod after the letter that's in front of it, it always causes the, uh, the E sound to appear. The letter itself is used as a vowel in this case here. It is a y sound, but if it precedes a letter like in the case here, and then in the case of the lamed, the next one there, it would have the, the, the F would have a fi, and then the L would have a li, and then the M sound at the end, M. All right, so it's hanaflim. That's how we get that pronunciation. But if there's no, there's an, over here in this next word here, there's no yod in there. They put the little dot underneath that letter fe, which is a vowel sound that gives it an E sound, but it's incorrect. Because if Moses felt it different, and of course, when we look at the context of the sentence, that Enoch comes from, Enoch, they're assuming that he comes from the fallen angels. He didn't come from the fallen angels. If you take it according to the way Moses wrote it, he came from the fallen ones, period. So it's Hanaphalim, not Nephilim. So literally, Enoch's father is a fallen angel. Now, a lot of people say, well, how could that happen? The flood came and, you know, and God imprisoned the fallen angels for what they did. Well, remember, there's only like 200 of them actually fell out of how many thousands? So there might have been some more falling angels happening after the flood. That's the only thing that we could really figure out from that. So now with that being said, so 
Kim, when we come back to this, this might help your husband too, if he's listening in on this. We come back over here, again, we got the exact same thing with the Nephilim. It's not Nephilim. That's interesting in itself. So technically now what we're reading is not Nephilim, but Nephilim. These are the actual fallen angels themselves. So the first sentence says, ha Nephilim ha So the, the, the Nephilim were in the earth, uh, which means in, in those days. Uh, and also, and also, or excuse me, actually it says, uh, see, when I read it in Hebrew, I, I automatically know what it means and says there. And then I look over in the English and I'm like, oh, goodness, it, it's, I don't, it's not that sometimes translations are incorrect. It's just maybe you might would translate it differently. And that kind of goes back to when you guys were looking at that Greek verbiage over in the book of Jude. It's a very good example of that there. When I'm looking at Jude, and because I, I never studied Greek, so other than like you guys, I'm looking at the lexicon. But in Hebrew, I've studied Hebrew from, from four different sources in my life, from Christian college, Hebrew college in Israel, Old Pound in Israel, and also from synagogue. Uh, back when I was much younger. So I'm, and then of course, modern Hebrew, uh, also learning that as well. So I've got it from all those different directions. And so I have, and then of course, all the different studies that I do, you know, in language and stuff, I guess that's a, another two or three different ways that I've studied it. So I got a, a huge variety of ways to be able to understand the language. So when I'm looking at a context of what I'm reading, it helps me to think differently in the way that it should be translated. So, and so the word vagam is, and also after, uh, after this is what it would be. So let's say, and also after that, or after, yeah, because that's the same thing. The sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. A lot of people think that it's, Okay, the, Neph the Nephilim were in the earth in that day there, and the sons of God, some uh, biblical teachers will say, and I prefer to call that biblical teachers in this case, they try to say that the sons of God are Adam's sons. Well, it can't be. If it was, it, it would have said, uh, Yabo bene Adam, just like it said about, and the daughters of Adam. El benot ha'adam is there, but in this case says ve'yabo b'nei ha'elohim, the sons of God. The fallen angels are considered to be sons of God, and that is consistent even in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They are called sons of God. And so it only, it, all it is is giving you a different verbiage when you get to that point there, but now it's letting us know that these sons of God were the fallen angels themselves and they they come into the daughters of men, and they bear children to them. And of course, when you go to reading in the uh, where is it at? I forget now which books it, it's, it's in. It may have been the Egyptian works there, but it says that they transformed themselves. Yeah, it was Egyptian works. They transformed themselves to appear as if they were their husbands. Otherwise, these women wouldn't have wouldn't have uh, had any kind of relationship with them. Uh, and then it causes them to produce these uh, these men, these mighty ones that are from eternity. Now, that male alarm, that's really got me baffled, too, because then it says here, on a share Hashem, which is men of the name. And, and when you've got that that letter hey in front of the word Shem for name. Um, and by the way, that can have two different possibilities of translation there. Again, they put the vowels in there, so they make you think it's the word, uh, name, uh, but it could be the man of like saying that place or there, um, there, there's a lot of different ways that that could possibly go. And I guess it would really depend on the context of this, but that whole part about Meolam, they are from eternity. And so it really shows us that these fallen angels, that the, the, the daughters of men, they are really dealing with 
we would say divine entities that corrupted themselves. And, and it wasn't that um, a relationship with a woman on earth would be a corruption. That's not what it's implying. It's the fact that they weren't supposed to do that. Their job is was to watch over. That's why they're also called watchers. Uh, was to watch over humanity to keep humanity protected. So I got off on a long tant toot there. So, all right. Anybody else got a question? And we can go in a totally different direction too. I, I'm perfectly okay with that. I have a follow-up comment. Okay, go um, ahead. Okay, so here we are reading about this in the Old Testament and um, men of renown and the sons of God. And then lo and behold, there's this reference in the early church that they had slipped in to the church. So I'm just listening to you and listening. Okay, there's not been a great flood since this ta that time. So are they around today? Yes. Are they... Um, why, why do we not recognize them? What is it in that deception? It's, it's a totally different lane. So if, I'm just thinking out loud, but yeah. like, okay, what, how would we recognize them? Uh, what are they doing? What do they look like? Um, I'll just pause there. I'm just follow up and thank you. You're welcome, Kim. And, and yes, the, the thing is just like you noted, and that was one of the reasons why I taught on Jude quite quite a bit was the fact that it was showing that these these fallen angels um still are around today and this is going out in a really kind of a crazy way to say it and um i'm sure there may be some here that can understand what i'm going to say on this here but you've got all the conspiracy, I'll call it conspiracy theories. You've got a lot of conspiracy theories out there. They talk about shapeshifters and, and things like that. Um, from people in the intelligence community, and, and I'm talking about not just here in the U.S., I'm talking about even in Israeli intelligence, I have heard them talk about these entities have the ability to transform them or, or the way it was put to me at one point they can cause the human mind to perceive that you would perceive them to be something that they're not um if they want to you know uh look like tom jones in his early days they could literally cause your mind to uh think that that's who you're looking at uh, now that's from intel sources that i know um, and like i said i've had that told to me by israeli people as well as uh, people in um, in Washington as well. So it seems to be consistent in their in their thought on that. And and they both seem they both tell it the exact same way. Now, oddly enough, in the um, in the Nag Hammadi work that had came out, that was one of the things that had been mentioned in there that they were that when they first came to the women, the women refused them. The second time they come to them, they uh, they were able to cause themselves to appear as if they were their husbands. That's exactly the way it words it. So even today, um, that's why I think the scripture tells us, by their fruits, you shall know them. You know, we're being warned already that these entities, and uh, and I guess that would even imply whether they're a hundred percent or half or whatever the case may be. Uh, I mean, I mean, think about it. When Jesus says about the, uh, when he says in Matthew 23, you generation of vipers, um, in the Hebrew version, and there's, we've got, I think there's three different Hebrew versions out there of the book of Matthew. And we know from the early church fathers that Matthew wrote in the Hebrew language. Now, we don't have any books old enough to say that this is the authority of, of it, uh, although Nehemiah Gordon makes a very powerful case in uh, Kim Tobes' Hebrew Matthew 
because the idioms and the way that the language is structured is more accurate than that of the Greek language that we have. So that's one that I actually like because of that. Um, but that being said, in these Hebrew versions, it literally talks about a genealogy of vipers. So when we see that, it's, it, it appears to be that what we have is that the um, uh, these fallen angels, when they came down, and according to rabbis, that's why a lot of you got a lot of rabbis that think that the reptilians are good entities because they believe that they are the seraphim uh, of the Old Testament. And uh, so, at any at any point, though, the, the the point here that I'm trying to make is is that. Uh, uh, Jesus clearly identifies them in a lineage. Now, but it still, though, doesn't make them 100%. It's just like uh, the children of the fallen angels. You know, um, you still have a mother, though, that is, that is you know, because in this case, it seems like in every case, it's always the innocent person is the mother and the victim, or the victim in this case, and the the uh, perverted entity is is masculine, um, so that anyway that, that I hope that kind of helps answer that a little bit. I know that's kind of confusing way to answer that. So, all right, anybody else? Let me let me. I got to be careful and see. Cat's gonna beat me for mentioning her question there. Let's see, Ezra nine. Okay, yes. By the way, Galen, uh, oh, you, uh, we'll, let's bring Ezra 9 back into this because that's really, that is important. Uh, uh, Galen, what you're saying on that there, and I'm going to pull Ezra up because, in fact, I'm going to do, no, I'm not just going to pull Ezra. We're going to pull up another one if I can find it for you. Let me see here. Uh, let's go to share screen. And Ezra is the one that I share quite frequently. I found two. Galen, seeing you brought up Ezra 9, do you remember the one that I did on Isaiah? I found one in Isaiah very similar to Ezra. And it really blew me away when I ran across that. But, um, oh, I got to go to the chapter, not chapter one. Hang on. When we when we look at Ezra 9, this is where we see the mingling of the seed. Uh, this is when they're coming out of Babylon, and it says that uh, now when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to their abomination, even the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and names all these different names here, which, by the way, were the ones that had, had the relationship with fallen angels, um, even after the flood. This is where we find out about the story of Enoch and stuff over in the book of Numbers. But they have taken of their daughters for themselves. And if you remember, too, when Joshua goes in to spy out the land, the land is full of giants. You know, they said, we're all like grasshoppers next to them. Uh, so they have uh, so that so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands, and yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been first in this faithlessness. Now, by the way, some people in trying to do an apologetics for this say, "Oh, well, they put away their wives, and and they and they, and, they, and they didn't bring the kids with them, or nothing like that." Two problems. When you go into the next chapter of Ezra, no, they didn't all do that. Most of them did. But even when uh, when you have the king at that time sends back all the peoples to their lands, it was also the Moabites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, etc. They were also returned back to the Middle East, right back into Israel again. Uh, in this case, though, if you'll notice, they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. Once you've already got, see, the thing is, is the Canaanites and Hittites and all these groups here, they were already a mingled seed with the fallen angels. 
So what they did by by cohabitating with these uh, men and women, now both sexes can actually, in other words, the sons could take and have daughters of that are that are half breed and produce children by them, and then it began to weaken that bloodline. Now, as a result of that, though, now this is not all the Dead Sea Scrolls here that you see on the screen here, but uh, I'm going to see if I can. Let's see. Um, I'll see if I can find it real quick here. The one thing that's very interesting on some of the uh, opinions that the rabbis were writing at that time, and they uh, is sometimes they write really amazing opinions. And one of the things that they go into is like when they uh, when they talked about the mingling of the seed and literally the bloodlines and how that the priests were very guilty on this they go back and they speak about the scriptures that speak about that you're not to hybrid seed. You're not to, you know, you're not to crossbreed seed. And they actually say that these things are, were, were the types and uh, uh, the shadows of what was not supposed to be done. Um, and that's another interesting thing there, but there's, there's one in here. Um, where they go into a little bit more detail than what we have in Ezra that actually proves in the Dead Sea Scrolls that it was a mixing of the races there. And of course, too, um, when you deal with somebody like um, Tobia Singer, he'll, he likes to say that the word seeds is totally false, he said. He said that just proves that Paul was a false apostle and things like that. Uh, but the word seed, plural, seeds, is not an it's not a non-Hebraic uh, expression. Uh, it really does exist. We do have the word seeds, plural. You don't see it so much biblically in the Bible, uh, although I have found it there as well. But um that's another dangerous thing about Jewish people that are out there trying to tell us what the scripture really says. They tend to really make a mess out of all of this. Um, and then, but the bad thing is, is people believe that they're, that they're right on target and that, uh, and that, you know, that what they're saying is correct. Let's see here. By the way, this particular PDF, it doesn't have all of the Dead Sea Scrolls by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, I'm still trying to find longer versions. Uh, let me see. I guess I already went through. I, I must, let me see if there's one other, let's see, mingled. No, I'd have to find it later though, but there, I've, I've shared that many times before. There's some really amazing things on there. So, all right. So anyway, is anybody else might have a question? If not, we won't, I won't hold you guys any longer. So, so I just fear we give it, one more shot here, just in case there. So let me just check the messages last. I like Paul myself as well. And by the way, there is, speaking of Paul, and I will mention this real quick. If you listen to lectures, even like with this guy here, Robert Eisman, they're going to try to just bash Paul as an anti-Semite and everything else. Um, I find it kind of fascinating their arguments of why they figure this particular guy should be thrown out or that guy should be thrown out. Um, 
And it's some of it's just flat out ludicrous. But so you always got to keep that in mind. And you don't want it to shake you either, because um, that's why I deal with Tovia Singer from time to time. I'll share things because he does so much damage to believers. It's not funny. And I've, I've had people that have listened to our ministry for years that uh, a husband or a wife will write in and say, Steve, what do I do? My husband or my wife has fallen for everything that Tovia Singer is saying. And I've only done a handful of videos about Toby, and I actually know Toby. That's the strange thing. But, uh, you know, and he's such a gifted, very knowledgeable speaker and very convincing. But I would spend the rest of my life if all I did was debunk everything he does. But everything he's done thus far, I can, but it takes a lot of work. Uh, because he's very smart, very crafty in the way he does it. And so many people just fall for the lies. And so, but the handful that I have done on there should help people enough to know, okay, it's not the way he says it. And it's not so clear cut. And he doesn't ever say anything about what I say. And yet, you know, I know he does listen. He just doesn't want to say anything. So anyway, all right, guys, well, we're going to close for tonight. Thank you for joining and uh, God bless you. And uh, and if you want, uh, even I'll still probably do a teaching next Thursday, regardless. I need to go back to the one I was going to do. But uh, but I am going to take if you want to take and compile some questions or whatever that you might have it gives you time to think you say, oh, gosh, I wish I'd ask this or ask that. Um, you could even. Maybe what I need to do is create an email just for this type of um, uh, what we're doing here. I'll try to, I'll see if I got an email that I could use that doesn't get much email in it uh, to where you could, if you wanted to email the question, you could do that. And that way it'll give me time to kind of look it up too as well. So um, I, well, I'll say this, let's do like this here. Um, if you email me on Israeli News Live at gmail.com, uh, I do get a lot of email there, but it's a little bit easier for me to find it, especially if you put it in the subject, questions for Thursday. Just remember to put that in the subject, questions for Thursday. And then that way there, uh, I can take time to go in there and look at some of those and review them. And uh, maybe I'll have a better, better answer when we do speak again. So God bless y'all. Y'all have a great night. And thank you for joining tonight. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you, Steve. You're very welcome. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. God, God bless, bless you, guys. God bless you, Brother Paul.